Okay, Finney's Lectures on Systematic Theology, Lecture 2. Even though I don't think this is quite the modern definition of systematic theology. One, uh, lecture 2, 1. Term government defined. 2. Distinction between moral and physical government. 3. Fundamental reason of moral government. Four, whose right it is to govern. Five, what is implied in the right to govern. Six, limits of the right to govern. Seven, what is implied in moral government. Eight, moral obligation defined. Nine, conditions of moral obligation. One, define the term government. The primary idea of government is that of direction, guidance, control, by or in accordance with rule or law. This seems to be the generic signification of the term government, but it appears not to be sufficiently broad in its meaning to express all that properly belongs to moral government, as we shall see. This leads me to to distinguish between moral and physical government. All government, as we shall see, is and must be either moral or physical. That is, all guidance and control must be exercised in accordance with either moral or physical law, for there can be no laws that are not either moral or physical. Physical Government is control, exercised by a law of necessity or force, as distinguished from the law of free will or liberty. It is the control of substance, as opposed to free will. The only government of which substance, as distinguished from free will, is capable, is and must be physical. This is true whether the substance be material or immaterial, whether matter or mind, states and changes, whether of matter or mind, that do not consist in the actions of free will, must be subject to the law of necessity. In no other way can they be accounted for. They must therefore belong to the department of physical government. Physical government, then, is the administration of physical law, or the law of force. Thus the states and changes of our intellect and sensibility come under the department of physical government. These states and changes are affected by a law of necessity as opposed to the law of liberty, or free will. The intellect and sensibility as we shall abundantly see hereafter, are so correlated to the will that its free actions produce certain changes in them by a law of force or necessity. Thoughts and feelings are not strictly moral actions for the reason that they are not voluntary and must therefore belong to department of physical as opposed to moral government. There is a secondary sense in which thoughts and feelings, as also outward actions, may be regarded as belonging to the Department of Moral Government, and consequently as possessing moral character. As thoughts, feelings, and outward actions are connected with and result from free actions of the will by a law of necessity. A moral agent must be responsible for them in a certain sense, but in such cases, the character of the agent belongs strictly to the intention that caused them, and not to those involuntary and necessary states and actions themselves. They cannot strictly come under the category of moral actions, as we shall more fully see hereafter, for the reason that being the result of a law of necessity, they do not, cannot, with strict propriety, be said to belong to the Department of Moral Government. 
Moral government consists in the declaration and administration of moral law. It is the government of free will is distinguished from substance. Physical government presides over and controls physical states and changes of substance or constitution, and all involuntary states and changes. Moral government presides over and controls or seeks to control the actions of free will. It presides over intelligent and voluntary states and changes of mind. It is a government of motive as opposed to a government of force. Control exercised or sought to be exercised in accordance with the law of liberty as opposed to the law of necessity. It is the administration of moral as opposed to physical law. Moral government includes the dispensation of rewards and punishments. Moral government is administered by means as complicated and vast as the whole of the works and providence and ways and grace of God. 3. I am to inquire into the fundamental reason of moral government. Government must be founded in a good and sufficient reason, or it is not right. No one has a right to prescribe rules for and control the conduct of another, unless there is some good reason for his doing so. There must be a necessity for moral government, or the administration of it, is tyranny. Is there any necessity for moral government? And if so, wherein? I answer that from the nature and relations of moral beings, virtue or holiness is indispensable to happiness. But holiness cannot exist without moral law and moral government, for holiness is nothing else than conformity to moral law and moral government. Moral government, then, is indispensable to the highest well-being of the universe of moral agents, and therefore ought to and must exist. The universe is dependent upon this as a means of securing the highest good. This dependence is a good and sufficient reason for the existence of moral government. Let it be understood, then, that moral government is a necessity of moral beings, and therefore therefore right, when it is said that the right to govern is founded in the relation of dependence. It is not, or ought not to be intended, that this relation itself confers the right to govern, irrespective of the necessity of government. The mere fact that one being is dependent on another does not confer on one the right to govern and impose upon the other obligation to obey, unless the dependent one needs to be governed and consequently that the one upon whom the other is dependent cannot fulfill to him the duties of benevolence without governing or controlling him. The right to govern implies the duty to govern. Obligation, and consequently the right to govern, implies that government is a condition of fulfilling to the dependent party the duties of benevolence. Strictly speaking, the right to govern is founded in the intrinsic value of the interest to be secured by government, and the right is conditioned upon the necessity of government as a means to secure those interests. I will briefly sum up the argument under this head as follows. 1. It is impossible that government should not exist. 2. Everything must be governed by laws suited to its nature. 3. Matter must be governed by physical laws. 4. The free actions of will must be governed by by motives, and moral agents must be governed by moral considerations. 5. 
We are conscious of moral agency and can be governed only by a moral government. 6. Our nature and circumstances demand that we should be under a moral government because Subsection 1. Moral happiness depends upon moral order. Subcomment 2. Moral order depends upon the harmonious action of all our powers as individuals and members of society. Subcomment 3. No community can perfectly harmonize in all their views and feelings without perfect knowledge, or, to say the least, the same degree of knowledge on all subjects on which they are called to act. 4. But no community ever existed, or will exist, in which every individual possesses exactly the same amount of knowledge, and where the members are, therefore, entirely agreed in all their thoughts, views, and opinions. Subcomment 5. But if they are not agreed in opinion, or have not exactly the same amount of knowledge, they will not in everything harmonize as it respects their courses of conduct. Subcomment 6. There must therefore be in every community some standard or rule of duty to which all the subjects of the community are to conform themselves. Subcomment 7. There must be some head or controlling mind whose will shall be law and whose decision shall be regarded as infallible by all the subjects of the government. 8. However diverse their intellectual attainments are, in this they must all agree that the will of the lawgiver is right and universally the rule of duty. 9. This will must be authoritative and not merely advisory. 10. There must of necessity be a penalty attached to and incurred by every act of disobedience to this will. 11. If disobedience be persisted in, exclusion from the privileges of the government is the lowest penalty that can consistently be inflicted. And 12. The good, then, of the universe imperiously requires that there should be a moral governor. All right, Lord willing, we will continue with uh, Roman numeral four, whose right it is to govern next week. Thank you.